When the Sherman tank originally went into combat, it was a great tank. However, it did have its flaws, its gun. The short-barreled 75mm gun is almost useless at long range, compared to the long 75 and 88 mounted on German tanks. This was an extremely large downfall of the early Shermans. The British managed to squeeze a QF-17 Royal Ordnance 17 pounder anti-tank gun in the small Sherman turret. It proved to be a viable stopgap measure to counter the abysmal situation that the Allied tank crews faced when liberating the Low Countries. The Sherman Firefly is one of the best tanks the Allies could come up with in order to counter the German Big Cats. The US M4 medium tank was developed from the dawn of the outbreak of the war and was primarily used by the US Army in the majority of the war. It had a simple layout which consisted of a five-man crew, driver, radio operator, gunner, commander and loader. The M4 was widely used, however its flaws were visible from very early on. Although its armor was weak, its firepower could still be upgraded. When the British got their Shermans, they were quite happy with them. However, in preparation for Normandy and the landings in D-Day, it was requested that the new gun would be fitted. This is because the M4 Short 75 was deemed to be inadequate for dealing with the task of destroying Panthers and Tigers at long range. A new anti-tank gun was introduced in February of 1943 and it was first used in the Italian campaign. It was the QF-17 Pounder anti-tank gun, which had a high-velocity gun and was like the German 75mm Pac-40 and Pac-42. It could reliably knock out all of the German tanks at close range and could be effective at long range. The main idea was that the Firefly would get the first shot off, rather than getting hit and firing back. This is because the Sherman's armour was paper thin and was put up against the German anti-tank guns. The 17-pounder could fire AP, HE, APDS, and many other rounds. When firing high explosive, or HE, the velocity of the shell was slower than that of the standard M4 75mm gun. The HE round was quite useful for light targets, therefore the fireflies could be coupled with standard M4s in a column. Every column would be required to have four standard M4s and a firefly to deal with the larger German armour. The longer barrel had a significant drawback, as the German commanders were well informed of the Firefly's presence on the battlefield, and therefore wanted to eliminate it as soon as possible before it could pose a significant threat to their ambush. Firefly tank crews knew about the tendency for German commanders to shoot at the Fireflies first, so they started painting the lower sections of the barrel with a creamy white colour, or even adding fake muzzle brakes within the barrel. This, at a glance, might throw off a German commander, however studying it for long enough would find that it is a disguised firefly. Up until the arrival of the M26 Pershing with its powerful 90mm gun, the Allies only had the Firefly and long barreled 76mm Shermans, which will be another topic of another video. The Firefly remained as one of the only tanks in the Western Front that could easily counter the German Big Cats. Against the Panther, Allied tanks before the Firefly were extremely vulnerable at long range to this tank. This even became a large enough problem that it nearly became a political scandal in the UK. This eventually became quite serious and even Field Marshal Montgomery decided to get involved and claim that the threat posed by German tanks is not to be taken seriously and that the Allied tanks were winning in the majority of engagements. This was not true as the Allied tank crews putting on extra armour onto their tanks, such as welded plates, wood and even concrete. It was found that the Panther could be killed by two ways. The first was by shooting at the shot trap on the Panther D, A or early G, where the curve of the mantlet could potentially ricochet a shell into the roof of the hull, which would allow for the shell to penetrate the thin armour of the roof. However, this was fixed in the later Panther Gs with an additional chin on the mantlet. The next thing was to hitting on the ground in front of the panther where the shell would ricochet off the ground into the bottom of the hull. These would require a large amount of skill and for the tanks to get really close up to the German tanks. The Firefly 17 pounder AP shell could not penetrate the upper front glacier, however could deal with some of the armour on the panther. German propaganda also released footage of an M3 Lee being tested against a Panther. Although it was an outdated M3, it did outline the superiority of many German designs. Maybe it restored hope to some of the people of Nazi Germany. Who knows? Against the Tiger I. The Firefly and Tiger I were pretty equal. 
Armor doesn't really count when your opponent can easily penetrate most of your armor. The same goes for the Firefly. No armor doesn't really matter when the enemy can penetrate over twice your original amount of armor. The Firefly was very crammed with a large breach and a small turret. It would have affected the crew's performance. Fireflies were also targeted by tigers as they were a threat, so fireflies are extremely vulnerable at close range. The hull of the Firefly was that of the M4A4. As the Firefly came around the mid-production of Shermans, it was upgraded and had modifications learnt from the previous Shermans. The Firefly's bogies were spread further apart than on the earlier Sherman, as well as having roller wheels to separate it from the main bogey, as a small rail to help support the track. The radio section in the back of the standard Sherman was moved in order to fit the large 17-pounder into the small turret. The gun was fitted on its side, which allowed for easier loading for the loader. As the gun ammunition was naturally much larger than the original 75mm shells, there had to be more space for the shells. The radio operator who sat next to the driver was removed, leaving a four-man crew. The small box on the rear of the turret is the casing for a radio, which was welded on and had an opening in it, to be accessible from within the turret. The bow 30 cal machine gun was also removed and replaced with a welded plate. The plates on the driver's hatches on the Firefly are for extra armor protection, although they are just thin plates. An interesting encounter happened when the Allies were securing the town of Conn. One of the Irish Guards troop commanders, Lieutenant George Gorman's driver, asked him what they would do when encountering a King Tiger. Gorman replied that they would use naval tactics, and when the Tiger II's 88 wasn't looking, they would ram it. A few days later, British and Canadian forces were moving towards a ridgeline, where German fire had been seen. In between where they were and where the ridge was, there was a river, in which Gordon's tank got bogged down. His crew took control of another tank. When they reached the ridgeline, they were confronted with something quite extraordinary. Four German tanks, a Panzer IV, Tiger I, Panther and a feared Tiger II. The King Tiger's turret started to rotate towards Gorman Sherman. Gorman told his gunner to fire, however nothing happened. The 75mm had jammed, so Gordon signalled his driver to ram the King Tiger. The gunner wrestled with the gun until it fired. The shell hit the King Tiger but ricocheted into the distance. The Sherman hit the rear of the left track of the Tiger II, immobilising it on both the King Tiger and the Sherman. The impact of the crash almost knocked out Gorman, however he quickly yelled at his crew to get out of the vehicle. They fled and ran for cover. The assistant driver or radio operator, Sergeant Agnew, jumped into a ditch. He discovered four King Tiger crew members in the ditch. He produced a very cheeky salute and went to find another ditch. They managed to get into a Sherman Firefly and then put several shots into the Tiger II and their previous Sherman. Gorman received the military cross and his driver the military medal. Another encounter was that of Michael Wittmann and Joe Eakins. Michael Wittmann was one of the most notorious tank commanders of the Second World War, having been credited with 138 tank kills. Joe, however, not so well known. He worked as a shoemaker at the beginning of the war, however managed to kill one of Germany's most prestigious tank commanders. Joe felt that he had a part in trying to defeat the struggle of Nazi Germany and was inspired by the Irish Guards. He was assigned as a gunner in a Sherman Firefly. In Joe's squadron there were only three Fireflies, the rest were all standard Shermans. All tanks in their squadron were named after Soviet towns and cities in recognition of their Soviet allies. Eakin's tanks was called Veliak Luki. Eakin's had only fired the 17-pounder once, at a testing ground. They were in an orchard just after the Normandy landings of Operation Overloom. They were waiting, and three Tiger Ones came along. They were out of reach by the other Shermans, and only the Firefly was able to hit the Tigers at that range. His commander moved out of the orchard's cover, and Eakins lined up the shot. He aimed for the Tiger at the rear. He fired two shots. The AP rounds hitting the weaker side of the armor and penetrating the crew commandment and engine. The Tiger caught on fire. The second one spotted the Firefly, the Firefly reversed back into cover. The Tiger shot a few rounds and one hit the turret. Although the turret was hit, it was still operable. The Firefly moved out. Eakins took out the other Tiger with a single shot, the AP shell hitting the ammunition rack on the side of the tank. The ammunition went off, knocking out the Tiger. The third Tiger tried to run for cover. Eakins fired again and destroyed the Tiger. What Eakins did not know at the time is that the commander of one of the Tigers was the infamous Michael Wittmann. Multiple claims were made after the war, such as a Canadian, British, Polish, or even an RAF claim that the Typhoon had killed Wittmann's tank with RP-3 rockets. 
Eventually, after much persuasion from friends, Eakins decided to speak of his encounter. He told the press and went to Bovington Tank Museum. Many historians now believe that it was him, a noble shoemaker, who destroyed one of Nazi Germany's most notorious Panzer Aces. He was also given the opportunity to fire a Challenger too, in which he hit the target first try. He has become the oldest person to fire a Challenger 2's gun. He sadly died in 2012, aged 88. The Sherman Firefly remains as one of the greatest and most prestigious of British tanks. Having been just a stopgap measure, it became one of the most formidable tank destroyers. Those two stories are truly remarkable. I recommend researching and reading about them more. I've only just skimmed the surface. Multiple fireflies are still around today, such as the ones in North Africa, Argentina, Netherlands and Bovington and many more. I have visited the firefly at Bovington. It is truly a masterpiece which is both cared for and looked after. If you are interested in tanks, I recommend going to the Tank Museum Bovington. It is great for anyone. I am planning to go there again after lockdown, maybe with one of my tanks. Thank you very much for watching. If you would like to support my channel's development, then please consider subscribing. Next week's video will be very similar to this one. It is about the same tank, just without the extra anti-tank gun. That's all from me today. Thank you for watching and goodbye.